Good afternoon, and welcome to Landscape Architects as Federal Leaders, a presentation on how landscape architects are providing their unique design perspectives at some of our federal agencies on projects across the country, and how you, the webinar participants, can apply for federal positions that will utilize your specialized design skills and talents. My name is Roxanne Blackwell, and I am the Director of Federal Government Affairs for the American Society of Landscape Architects, also known as ASLA. Today's webinar is sponsored by ASLA and our sister organization, the Landscape Architecture Foundation. ASLA's Government Affairs Department works with federal, state, and local policymakers to address core issues important to landscape architects including policies that address water and stormwater management, transportation planning and design, community design and development, parks and recreational facilities, small business issues, and of course, protecting and promoting licensure for the profession. ASLA's government affairs team spends many hours on Capitol Hill working with legislators to pass measures that benefit the profession and in the state legislatures to defend licensure. And we also work with our federal agencies on regulations and program implementation, which provides us with a great opportunity to interface with our federal landscape architects for their critical guidance and information. And so I'm very pleased today that, that today's webinar will now provide all of you with the invaluable guidance, insight, and information from our federal landscape architects. So before we get started, I have some housekeeping issues that I'd like to share with you. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, and we encourage you to submit questions to our presenters using the questions tab on the left side of your screen. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time. We will be monitoring the questions and we'll try to respond more quickly if we see something that shouldn't wait until the Q&A period. For example, if we need to clarify something. I would also like to point out a novel feature for those of you that wish to take notes during the presentation. When you click on the Notes tab on the right-hand side of the screen, you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the presentation. If you are interested in a PDF copy of the PowerPoint or would like to download any files referenced during the talk, you can click on the Resources tab on the left-hand side of the player. Simply click on any of the file names to initiate the download. Also, if you experience any technical problems during the course of this webinar, you can click on the Request Support button on the lower left of the player, and we have a technical expert there to help out with whatever problem you may have. Finally, this webinar is recorded and will be posted on the ASLA website for future viewing. And one more thing, as a participant of this live presentation, you will be sent a brief survey to get your feedback on this event. I encourage each of you to take this survey so that we can plan for future events. Thank you, Roxanne. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you, you are listening in from. And welcome to Landscape Architects as Federal Leaders. I am Ariana Kadunis, the Program Manager at the Landscape Architecture Foundation. The schedule you will be hearing from leaders in the U.S. Forest Service and the Smithsonian Institution regarding their career paths and the breadth and depth of places and policies they impact the perspective of an emerging professional will be shared, and you will also learn about the pathways to entering government service. Please feel free to submit questions in the questions tab at any time. During the 45-minute mark, our first three presenters will field some questions. At the hour mark, there will be another 10-minute period for answering questions before wrapping up today's presentation. In the resources section of this platform, you will notice some helpful links as well as a recording by Lauren Marshall of the U.S. Forest Service on how to navigate USA jobs. To get started, I'll share the context that precipitated today's webinar. The Landscape Architecture Foundation is a national nonprofit organization founded 50 years ago by some of the leading landscape architects of the day with the mission to preserve, protect, and enhance the environment. We work to increase our collective capacity to achieve sustainability, and we do so by investing in research, scholarships, and leadership. 
Since our founding during the height of the environmental movement, LAF's work has been and continues to be anchor in making the most of this moment in time. Building off of this aim, in August 2014, LAF initiated a series of federal leaders roundtables, an opportunity for landscape architects throughout the federal government to engage in cross-agency dialogue. The following 10 agencies, as well as LAF and ASLA, have participated in one or more of the three roundtables held to date. While the conversation began with a focus on identifying opportunities for collaboration, a broader topic of how to highlight landscape architecture opportunities across the federal government also emerged. During LAF Summit on Landscape Architecture and the Feature held this June, the topic continued with a panel on public practice moderated by Mia Lair featuring the U.S. General Services Administration, the Philadelphia Department of Parks and Recreation, the City of San Antonio, as well as two leading nonprofits, the Trust for Public Land and the New York Restoration Project. Careers in public service offer many exciting and important opportunities. A 2014 survey of ASLA's professional practice networks asked members, which sector do you find most rewarding to work in? 42% of survey participants indicated that the public sector was the most rewarding. Among the many reasons for working in the public sector, I'll share comments provided by two participants. You can address public needs while also adding beauty and ecological health to projects. There is an ability to investigate issues in depth and create policy that has wide-ranging impacts. Today's speakers, in the order in which they will be presenting, are as follows. Matt Arn, who has served as the U.S. Forest Service's Chief Landscape Architect since 2010. In this role, he provides professional guidance to the agency's 150 landscape architects, practicing on over 190 million acres of national forests and grasslands. Jennifer Daniels is Senior Landscape Architect for the Smithsonian's National Zoo in the Office of Planning and Strategic Initiatives. She is also a founding member of the Smithsonian's Climate Change Adaptation Plan Working Group. Jesse English is a landscape architect for the Forest Service as a Recreation, Wilderness, and Trails Program Manager for the National Forest in Tallahassee, Florida. He is currently on a four-month detail as the Regional Landscape Architect and Recreation Planner for the Northern Region in Missoula, Montana. Emily Lauderdale is a landscape architect working for the Forest Service as a Presidential Management Fellow. She is based out of the Willamette National Forest in Springfield, Oregon, and currently serves as a Natural Resource Specialist and NEPA Planner. Logan Free is a landscape architect working for the Forest Service as a Presidential Management Fellow with the Recreation, Heritage, and Volunteer Services Staff Unit in Washington, D.C. During today's webinar, you will learn how landscape architects make a difference in protecting, preser preserving, and enhancing public lands, gain familiarity with the range and types of projects, national policies, and initiatives undertaken by federal agency landscape architects. Explore a variety of leadership roles within landscape architecture across different agencies and identify pathways to a career as a landscape architect in the federal government. Without further ado, take it away, Matt. Well, thanks, Ariana, and thank you, Roxanne. Um, thank you to ASLA and to LAF for making this happen, and an extra big thank you for keeping it free. So um, I'm Matt Arn. I'm the Chief Landscape Architect for the U.S. Forest Service. And uh, I don't want to start off by boring you all into an early ejection from this webinar by reciting my position description and rattling off my core duties and my daily routine. So when people ask me what I do, I usually just tell them I'm a landscape architect. And I also tell them that I'm in the legacy business. Now, my kids think that I just draw dinosaurs and garbage trucks all day, which would be a pretty cool job. <laughs> So in its most basic sense, my job is all about understanding that our world is not made up of individual disconnected things. It's about giving love and commitment to our public lands, and it's about connecting people to the outdoors and leveraging good design and planning to help people find value and meaning in their open spaces. So a particularly satisfying aspect of my work is celebrating the roles of our 150-plus landscape architects as integral in defining the character of our national forests and our grasslands through what we build, where we build, and how we maintain our sites. I try to stress great design in everything we do, from roads, scenic byways, trails, campgrounds, to visitor centers, interpretive areas, and other recreation sites and facilities. And sometimes uh, that's easier said than done. So for the next 12 minutes or so, I'm going to introduce you or reintroduce you to the Forest Service and our public lands, 
I'll talk a little bit about what our LAs do and what it's like to work here, and I'll offer up some commentary on leadership, uh, some random observations about federal practice, and I'm going to close with some thoughts on why any of this matters. So the Forest Service administers the nation's 154 national forests and 20 national grasslands, which, uh, as Ariana said, encompass 193 million uh, acres of land, which is about the area the size of Texas. Hello, Texas, if you're out there. In my humble opinion, we are responsible for some of the most scenic and picturesque places in the nation, including 10 national monuments, 22 national recreation areas, and 11 national scenic areas. We manage 36 million acres of wilderness. We have 122 wild and scenic rivers, 156,000 miles of trails, and 370,000 heritage sites. One of the best statistics I can offer right now, though, is that 230 million Americans live within 100 miles of a national forest. So one of the best things about practicing in the Forest Service is the incredible diversity of the landscapes we manage and the experiences we provide. So I'm going to give you just a quick sampling. Now, this is the Chugach National Forest in Alaska, uh, home to thousands of glaciers, over 3,500 miles of shoreline, and the largest contiguous wetland um, acreage on the Pacific Coast. It also produces about 66 million of uh, salmon a year, which is 11% of the Pacific salmon production. And for those of you who follow competitive dog sledding, and I know you're out there, the Chugach incorporates more than 180 miles of the Iditarod National Historic Trail, which is known as the Southern Trek. This is a shot of Kirk Creek Campground overlooking Pfeiffer Beach in Monterey County, California. Now, not many of uh, folks know that the Forest Service manages coastal cliffs uh, with a lot of spectacular waterfalls, rocky shores, uh, perfect for the tide pooling set and the rock, climb, rock hunting, uh, as well as sandy California beaches suitable for surfing, fishing, and swimming. There's another shot of Pfeiffer Beach, and I love that little keyhole. One of the beach boys lives right up the beach from there, which is also fairly interesting. <laughs> All right, so the next one, let's see. Okay, this is Medewa National Tallgrass Prairie. It's located just one hour from Chicago. Now, Medewa is the largest tallgrass prairie ecosystem in the U.S., and right now they are celebrating the arrival of 27 American bison. So in 2014, President Obama designated 346,000 acres of existing federal lands as the San Gabriel Mountains National Monument. The monument and the surrounding forests are working lands that provide Angelinos 70% of their available open space, as well as 30% of their drinking water. It's essentially the backyard to the nation's second largest urban center. So a little closer to my home here in D.C., that's Spruce Knob Seneca Rocks National Recreation Area. Uh, which contains the highest peak in West Virginia and some of the best rock climbing, mountain biking, and make-out spots on the East Coast. <laughs> Just wanted to see if you guys were still paying attention. Um, this area is also unique because it was the first national recreation area to be designated uh, to the Forest Service back in 1965. No presentation on our diversity of our landscapes would be complete without a shot of Multnomah Falls, which is in the Columbia River National Scenic Area, and it's the most visited recreation site in the Pacific Northwest, with about 2 million stopping in each year to take in the view. Now, the Benson Bridge that spans the lower falls uh, that you're looking at, I think, is a pretty good example of how great design can marry the natural and built environments. And it has served as a distinguishing characteristic of the fall since it was built back in 1914 by Simon Benson, who was one of the builders of the old Columbia Highway. And the highway engineer, Samuel Lancaster, once wrote of Noma Falls that the setting is ideal. It's pleasing to look upon in its every mood. It charms like magic. It woos like an ardent lover. It refreshes the soul and it invites to loftier, pure things. I'll let that sit for a second. I mean, I don't know any Forest Service engineers or LAs, for that matter, that can write like that. <laughs> So some of my other favorite places include Misty Fjords, National Monument in the Tongass, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness in Superior, Maroon Bells in the White River, the Redfish Lake in the Sawtooth National Forest, and the Natural Springs of Ocala National Forest, where I learned how to swim. So when people think about the Forest Service, they usually think about this fellow here, not the guy in the red flannel shirt. They are 
They aren't necessarily visualizing buffalo on the Medewin or surfing in Big Sur. And they're surely not thinking about the legacy of landscape architects who helped shape and steward many of the places we hold dear. So landscape architects like Burton Lytton, he's the father of our scenery management system and a champion of what was deemed common landscapes. So Lytton taught at Berkeley and worked for a research division in the 50s and 60s. He uh, transferred the visual components of art, including line, form, color, shape, value, space, and texture, into an organized way of assessing and planning for visual resources. The scenery management has been critical for how our agency strives to preserve the aesthetic value of our lands when we are building road, when unfortunately we are clearing timber, and when we are choosing vista points. Sorry about this slide, and no disrespect to Arthur Carhart. Um, he is the Forest Service first landscape architect. He's also known as the father of wilderness. Uh, we have a lot of fathers. Uh, in 1919, Carhart uh, surveyed a road in the White River National Forest uh, in Colorado near Trappers Lake as part of a recreation developed site master plan. After the survey, he decided that the proposed project should be scrapped and the land should be preserved. The Forest Service agreed and the area was protected. Now, this is the first time our agency made a call to set aside lands for their wilderness character. And again, um, a lot of that early work led to the 1965 passage of the Wilderness Act. All right, so let's fast forward um, a number of years. This is a shot of some of our young professionals at the 50th anniversary of the Wilderness Act, again, back at Trappers Lake on the White River. Uh, this is in 2015. Now, I do want people to know that we're not just an agency of old white guys cutting down trees in Wyoming, uh, though we do have a lot of work to do to build a diverse workforce that better reflects our changing society. Many of our next generation LAs and professionals, and I'm guessing many of those who are listening in today, have a strong emotional attachment to our public lands. From growing up camping, fishing, hiking, dog sledding, making out, whatever. Um, they also have an incredibly diverse uh, story uh, and are involved in an incredibly diverse portfolio of work. I hope you guys can see some of this on the screen. I'm not going to go through every uh, responsibility there, but it is, is quite an assortment. And you can get this in PDF and revisit some of these. And this is just a subset of the types of work that LAs and the Forest Service are involved with. More than anything, I would say uh, that a practicing with us requires an ability to work in multiple scales um, along an urban to wildland continuum. It requires a fairly flexible skill set uh, and an even more flexible mind. Now, Jesse, in his presentation in just a bit, is going to go into more detail on what skills could best serve someone who's considering a, a career with the Forest Service or another public land agency. It's really difficult in a few slides to capture the range of work that we're engaged in, from trails and bridges and interpretation, green infrastructure, identity, uh, children's exploration. Perhaps the easiest way for me to characterize landscape architecture in the Forest Service is to note it is a desire to connect people with their natural and their cultural resources in a way that respects and emerges from the conditions of the setting. So making a plan for the land and not vice versa is a core value that shapes our work, always remembering that our public image is defined by what we build or choose not to build, where we build, and how we maintain and operate. I love this shot. Um, this is a tent site on the Okanagan, Wenahachi, and uh, I think it's the Heather and Maple Pass. Uh, this is an incredibly minimalist intervention, which is uh, driven by safety concerns, but I think it's really thoughtful and elegant. So likewise, an observation deck on the Deschutes National Forest. This is at Settle Lodge. It has a fairly minimal footprint, and it really is about celebrating that view. So if international work is your thing, well, we've got international work, uh, primarily organized through USAID in our International Programs Office. International partnerships have allowed me personally uh, to design for a national children's garden in Muscat Oman, develop a recreation master plan for the Wadi, Wadi El Rayan World Heritage Site in the Fayoum, Egypt, uh, and create a comprehensive site facility and visitor use plan for the International Gorilla Conservation Program's World Heritage Visitor Center in Bwindi, Uganda, which you're looking at now. So most uh, of our landscape architects work in recreation programs on forests or in regions. Others work in enterprise teams, which function like small consulting firms 
as well as in urban forestry and research. Um, my own feeling is that recreation really is the future of our agency. It's how many of us have come to understand value and meaning in our public lands. Uh, we look at about 170 million visitors a year who spend $13 billion, over $13 billion directly on the forest. And that number is more than 50% of our agency's gross domestic product, product contribution. So when you think about timber, grazing, minerals, all of those other uses, economic uses, uh, they don't even make up the entire second half. So what does it really mean to be practicing recreation in the Forest Service? Um, it's all about experiences. Our visitors take part in activities right, hiking, uh, kayaking, uh, mountain biking, etc. cetera. Um, the settings are the combination of the place and the intervention that we make as planners or designers uh, and the experiences that they have derived from those mashups. So as an example, here you have an urban setting. In this case, I think it's the Milwaukee downtown riverfront. Uh, you have an activity, kayaking, which provides for a certain type of experience. In this case, social, safe, and hopefully fun. All right. Same activity, different setting, different experience. Same activity, different setting, very different experience. So as designers and planners for public lands, we need to recognize that our visitors want these different experiences and that it's our job to balance those experiences, but do it in a way that limits impacts to our forests and our grassland settings. So I'm the first to admit that we don't always get it right. Uh, needless to say, we do a lot of NEPA. Um, our processes can be very glacial in time. We're doing uh, a lot more than we can with a little bit of resources, um, but we do try to make our work now very public uh, and very, very incorporative of different ideas and perspectives. So this conversation is called Federal Leaders, and I thought I would just take a minute to offer my perspective on leadership before I hand it over to Jen. And there are tons of books and websites and obviously um, coffee mugs out there on leadership traits and strategies. Many people have gotten rich, you know, selling their would-be roadmaps to success. Leadership in federal service is really about 98% service to our public and to our lands. Now, titles are fine. Uh, but it isn't really uh, any room for arrogance. There's no chance that my kids, my wife, my friends, my colleagues would ever let my title of chief go to my head. So my hardly original advice to those that are still listening, I hope, is to find belief in what you're doing. Find a sense of purpose that your work matters, that it provides satisfaction. Leaders lead through personal example. And I don't think there's a better way to demonstrate leadership than to work on behalf of our public landscapes. So a couple of closing uh, observations and comments. Now, many, if not most of us, came into architecture and landscape architecture uh, because we wanted to design, we wanted to build, we wanted to influence, and we wanted to shape our surroundings. Over time, I've realized that one of the greatest contributions I can provide is to be a gatekeeper for my agency a gatekeeper to industry, private and public interests on what and how and where things get built. Now, it's somewhat ironic that I did come into this job and profession desperately wanting to put my stamp on something, but learning over time that nature's stamp is a lot more important than mine. So with that, I want to say thank you guys very much for listening in, and I'm going to turn it over to Jen Daniels. I'm Jen Daniels, uh, and I'm the Senior Landscape Architect for the Smithsonian's National uh, Zoological Park and Conservation Biology Institute. Um, first, I want to begin by thanking ASLA and LAF um, for inviting me to participate in this webinar and creating this opportunity. Uh, like Matt, I'm going to walk you through um, basically how landscapes play a stewardship role. Um, and what's involved in working with the Smithsonian and the National Zoo. You're going to notice a change in scale, um, and, uh, and, uh, and you'll see in the slide following. As a side note, um, the actual smoky bear, who went on to become a Forest Service, Forest Service icon, was actually delivered to the Smithsonian's National Zoo in Washington, D.C. If you come here, I'll show you exactly where he was delivered. Um, but it was an interesting moment because uh, he became an important media moment that promoted respecting our environment. The Smithsonian means so many things to so many people with 19 museums, a zoo, 
um, nine research facilities across the United States, and now in London with our latest decision to create a permanent exhibition, exhibition state space with the Victoria and Albert Museum. The Smithsonian welcomes 24.4 million visitors through its doors or landscapes annually, with about 2.2 million of them visiting the zoo. Landscapes are interpreted and represented in many ways within the Smithsonian. Here you see a multimedia exhibit, and here you see landscape paintings. So we're reminded constantly of the value and the interpretation of landscapes throughout the Smithsonian. Altogether, the Smithsonian holds about 43,000 acres of land worldwide. You're looking at the Smithsonian's Tropical Research Institute. The Smithsonian has landscape architects employed in two areas of the institution. One area is within Smithsonian Gardens, where the landscape architect's primary responsibility covers Smithsonian's museums and gardens along the National Mall. You're seeing the, you're looking at uh, the Enid Haup Garden on your right and Moongate Garden on your left. Uh, those landscape architects, of which there are actually only two, um, contribute to master planning, cultural landscape reports, as well as um, working with Smithsonian greenhouses and grounds management to review plant selection. This will be, if it's not already, a very um, recognizable uh, new museum, the African American History and Culture Museum. It's opening on the 24th of this month. Um, the landscape architect um, worked closely with the resident landscape architects as Gustafson, Guthrie, and Nichols work. So up the street, literally, um, is the other area where the Smithsonian employs a uh, landscape architect, um, and this is where I work, along with my colleagues. A view out my window really emphasizes that I go to work in a park every day. And every day, I feel very lucky um, that someone who visits my office regularly, um, it's fun, but they are eating all our plants, so it's a problem. <laughs> but that's for another webinar. Um, a few years ago, we started the Office of Planning and Strategic Initiatives to represent the interests of the National Zoo by being a multi-partial voice for the many priorities facing the physical development of our 163-acre public zoo at the Rock Creek campus here in Washington, D.C., as well as our non-public 3,200-acre research and educational campus outside Front Royal, Virginia. It is our role uh, to ensure that the physical development of the National Zoo properties are aligned with our mission by leading and managing multidisciplinary teams representing the zoo's four, five sorry, core points. That's animal care, education, science, sustainability, and visitor experience. Um, and I really want to emphasize here that this is a pretty high-performing landscape, and those multiple layers must learn to coexist and support one another, or like, at least know how to get out of each other's way gracefully and without conflict. Um, really think about this uh, landscape as a mini-city, um, one that's self-sufficient, and one that has to handle, as many public parks do, transportation, security needs, food production, which is obviously more towards the zoo. Um, and it really, our um, circulation points are highways of food distribution and also revenue generation. We do this by using a physical framework of, of a master plan that's informed by our strategic plan and programmatic plans. A programmatic plan for us really tells the story that we want to tell on our landscape. Um, and essentially, we are asking ourselves over and over again, what are those stories that we need to be telling on the site and revising them as we learn more? It's essentially like arranging puzzle pieces, um, looking into a crystal ball, um, and telling those conservation stories. Our Front Royal facility has a similar framework, um, but is um, more inward facing and research focused. So I'm going to share two sort of directions that um, we're currently working. Um, one is um, what's called our newest Olmsted Walk Design Guidelines. Um, and this is an example of how we're trying to communicate vocabulary and speak across um, disciplines whose disciplines often have different kinds of vocabulary. So we're trying to translate essentially and create better working groups. Um, the guidelines establish a vision for the zoo's primary walkway that celebrates the natural setting and preserves it to the greatest extent possible. 
The purpose of these design guidelines is to strike a balance between the ideals and aspirations for the zoo with the current constraints and ongoing pressures of the landscape, which can be anything from deer, like you saw earlier, or a limited budget. Our office also acts as an in-house design firm for the zoo on small-scale projects, um, as we're always strive, striving to be more nimble and at service to our animal care staff, uh, development staff, exhibit staff, um, because as we know in the federal system, I'll mention this later, um, speed is not our strong suit. Um, so we need to devise other methodologies to, to sort of counteract that. Um, one of our major capital projects that is um, what we're focused on right now is on migratory birds. Um, the project's called Experience Migration and is going to be the renovation of a 1927 historic building and a two and a half acre site. The emphasis really with these types of projects is on project diversity, um, really representing the community uh, within the Smithsonian. Um, and that could be anyone from exhibit developers, fundraisers, educators, scientists, horticulturists, and animal curators. The project itself will highlight a bird-friendly and pollinator-friendly landscape that sets the stage for experiencing migration. So a little history. Uh, the zoo was established by an act of Congress, and here you see uh, old white men. That's slowly changing, as Matt and I both agree on that. Um, surveying the site and looking out over the pastoral landscape, which has become the future zoo, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted is standing in the, I'm going to say it's a linen suit, the light suit, <laughs> along with the secretary and zoo director. Um, Frederick Law Olmsted was brought to do the first master planning. It was near the end of his life, so his um, stepson, John C. Olmsted, John C. also took um, over that role. And we have a ton of correspondence describing what they found um, and their poignant notes uh, about, the, about the zoo and how animals would always take prominence in our decision-making, which is true to this day. The zoo's presence is a reliable and beloved icon in the city and across the country. We see, these, we see this in moments like these. On the left is uh, when the zoo was shut down, when the government was shut down, sorry, and the zoo was closed. And on the right, um, the ever-popular panda. So um, part of why I'm here is to talk about um, the Smithsonian and not have, the Smithsonian's National Zoo and not have the word panda come after the zoo. Um, some of the more uh, positive or, I should say, really exciting parts of working for the Smithsonian as a landscape architect um, is the long-term relationship you get, you get to develop with the site. You really can spend time and live within the landscape and understand the many priorities and competing needs. This can also happen in an urban park setting. Um, I'm aware of the fact that there's not a lot of jobs within the Smithsonian, but it doesn't mean that there's not opportunities to do a similar style of work. Another um, very positive part of my job is this diversity of problem solving um, and the multi-partial approach that integrates everything from conservation messaging to the care of animals and revenue generating that we always have to take. Um, the other really important point is that often in federal um, bureaucracies, people tend to work in silos. So one of the skills of a landscape architect is to you know, work horizontally, and so that really helps a lot um, in our roles as um, leaders in the, in the Smithsonian to think more strategically about how to change that stereotype. The other thing is a really healthy live-work balance in a federal service um, as compared to some of my many friends in the private sector. Um, also, the Smithsonian is incredibly uh, diverse and just has a, a wealth of minds, um, both professionally and personally. It's fun to work in, and you feel proud to be a part of it. And there's a lot of cross-pollination, um, and there's an encouragement to do a lot of pan-institutional thinking, like, for example, the climate change uh, planning that I've been working at, taking a look at how the impact of climate change will have on our landscapes. Some of the challenges, of course, are some things that Matt mentioned, are limited staff, volatility funding, and timelines get elongated. But we're really trying to reshape assumptions, um, and this is something I'm, I, I'm 
I find very important right now as a leader is really trying to reshape assumptions of the role of landscape architects and projects. I think the LA Summit was one example where those dialogues are happening. Um, but I think we need to continue to redefine what landscape architects do and what we're capable of. So our secretary said, um, yeah, has this quote that you see and you can read it all, but I'm just going to extract one moment, um, which is, um, creativity means taking a different look at things the way they are. And I think if you enter into federal um, service, you might want to post this <laughs> since uh, you know, it can be challenging um, and you can feel like you're pushing a large boulder up a, up a, up a, up a slope. Um, but I think as Matt beautifully described with all his images is that we are in service and it's the long view that you need to take a look at. Um, and that to me, this quote that our secretary, um, Dr. David Scordon said was, this means that we have to challenge assumptions. Um, predictable ways of doing things um, can be changed. That, um, you know, to remember that landscape architects are systems thinkers and that we can together forge powerful teams within our communities to take that long view. We have the ability to bring experts to the table and we should always honor that. So, again, being a leader in the field and particularly, sorry, what it means to be a leader in the field, I don't yet feel that comfortability to say I'm a leader in the field, um, but one thing that landscape architects can think of about bringing, um, you know, changing the dialogue is that um, to remind ourselves constantly that our designs play an important civic role and that they are intri intrinsically connected in our case, um, being an urban zoo, to the success of our cities. They create those bright spots within our public realm. Uh, Frederick Law Olmsted always talked about, and um, his goals were to create democratic spaces, and I see that played out every day at the zoo. Um, it's an incredibly diverse population that visits our park, and that we need to honor that and remember that. Um, finally, uh, as we increasingly lose our wild places, our federal landscapes play an even more important role. Uh, the zoo is a conservation organization, and so we are always trying to transform thinking by putting people in these, albeit constructed landscapes, to tell a story that connects the story of an animal to the visitor and why it matters. The California condor, the black rutted ferret, and the scimitar horned oryx all owe their continued existence to the work done and money generated by these zoos and federal properties. So finally, I'm just going to quickly go through um, some of the guiding principles that I think about, um, one of which is, since I'm getting the time <laughs> to move on, is respecting and preserving the cultural landscape, refining design language. Enhancing visitor experience, finding those unexpected and transformative moments, integrating uh, informal learning, and promoting sustainability. And finally, to close, um, this is where I came from uh, in my private work, which was such an honor uh, to be working on uh, a landscape that was formerly private, that was turned back to the, or sorry, dedicated or donated to the um, Grand Teton National Park. Uh, in Wyoming. It's an awe-inspiring site, um, certainly would be the definition of sublime, but it really makes me stop and think um, about why I've chosen to be in federal service. So I will close there and send it to Jesse. All right, thanks, Jen. Um, so my name is Jesse English. I'm a uh, uh, currently the regional landscape architect for the northern region of the Forest Service, um, which is in um, Missoula, Montana. It covers the uh, the area of northern Idaho, Montana, and north and south Dakota. Um, so uh, I'm going to bore you a little bit with my work experience, uh, unlike Matt, so that uh, you'll have a little bit of an, an idea of what an L.A. can do day-to-day uh, -day in federal service. Um, so I started out as a landscape architect in Washington, D.C. Um, go to the next slide. Um, as a presidential management fellow, uh, which you'll hear about um, from uh, from Logan and Emily in just a little bit. Um, I uh, got to do work with Matt 
on, uh, you know, working with our recreation data, trying to improve uh, the information people had to be able to find our, our places and, and um, you know, be able to, to go and have the experiences that we hope they have on the National Forest. Um, I uh, also work a lot on uh, trying to figure out what sustainable recreation means, um, which, uh, you know, can kind of have two different aspects. One is the, the program management part of, you know, what is our capacity with our people, with our funding, um, you know, what can we hope to maintain in the long term. And then we also have the, the built environment aspect of it, um, which is um, we're, we're developing a product called the Sustainable Recreation Design Guide. And uh, what we hope that is is, is something similar to, to lead and to sustainable sites and to um, some of the, the stuff that the Landscape Architecture Foundation is putting together with their performance series. Um, and taking a lot of that stuff and, um, and trying to, to make it fit the type of work that we do in the Forest Service. You know, typically we have uh, very rural sites, um, very unique settings, very unique conditions. Um, and we're trying to figure out how to apply those uh, sustainable methods and metrics and building practices to um, to our Forest Service sites. While I was at PMF, I uh, went on a four-month detail to uh, Gifford Pinchot National Forest on the uh, in Vancouver, Washington, um, and there I got to work a little more on the ground doing um, recreation planning and site design at Mount St. Helens. It was kind of the main part. Um, you know, Mount St. Helens uh, exploded 30 plus years ago and basically made a moonscape of a, a wide patch of the, the Gifford Pinchot National Forest. And, and now that ecosystem is starting to, uh, to heal itself. Trees are starting to grow, grasses and animals are returning. And, and so there's a lot of uh, recreation demand that's starting to build up there as far as can we go camp, can we go hike, that kind of thing. And so um, I worked to, to help kind of figure out with the forest um, what can be done out there, especially considering the unique building conditions and, and, uh, and unique settings and considerations for an ecosystem that's, fra that's that fragile. Um, currently, I, uh, I work on the National Forest in Florida um, as the Recreation and uh, Wilderness and Trails Program Manager. So there, I, uh, for design, um, I do a lot of kind of small Operations and maintenance type. I, you know, we have the idea of urban acupuncture. It's kind of a uh, forest service rec site acupuncture of, um, you know, um, doing a lot of small tweaks and things. How can we improve accessibility of sites? How can we make them more sustainable? How can we fix some kind of long-term uh, maintenance problems that we may have? Um, and the, the other part of my job includes, um, you know, developing a program of work over the course of a year um, and, uh, and, and doing budgets and that kind of thing. Currently, I am uh, on a detail, like I said, in the northern region um, with the, uh, the, the northern region of Missoula, Montana. And mainly my job here is, is helping the forests in the region um, plan out their recreation programs. So trying to articulate what it is that we want to provide as a forest for the public. Um, you know, looking long term across there, uh, you know, for the next 30 years or so. You know, what is what are the the population demands that are going to um, affect us? Well, how is climate change going to affect us? Um, and, and kind of figuring out uh, what we can do for recreation. That involves a lot of integration between um, wildlife and with timber um, and, and other resource areas to kind of have that vision for for what you can provide on the forest over the next 30 years or so. So with LA work in the federal service and the positive and negative aspects of it, um, the positives are that uh, you get challenging and unique projects. A lot of our sites are in special places that, uh, that uh, you know, it's exciting to get the opportunity to work at. Um, you know, the work can have widespread impact, especially depending on what uh, level um, you work at. You know, on the forest, I'm, I'm, I'm helping, uh, you know, the National Forest in the state of Florida um, execute a program of work, um, and then in the region, I'm helping uh, I mean, region um, execute a, a program of work and plans. And then when you're in the DC office like Matt, you're uh, you know you're, you're having an effect on on all 193 million acres, and and so that's really satisfying. Um, like Jen touched on, the work balance and the stability is is very nice, especially to a lot of um, design firms. Um, the cool thing about the Forest Service is that you do get um, 
you do have the opportunity to work in all kinds of places. You know, we have we have forests, and, and not only do we have forests, but we have, uh, you know, state and private programs where you go work in New York City. Um, there's, there's a ton of different places to go and, and, and opportunities um, within the Forest Service, and that's really exciting. Um, and then the mission. Uh, you know, it's always very satisfying that the work that you do is for the public, um, and that's, that's, uh, that's, that's really satisfying. Um, the negatives, like we touched on, the t- project timelines can be very slow. Um, you know, you have constant uncertainty with budgets and, and lack of staff. Um, the federal environment can be risk-averse. It can be hard to innovate on things. Um, and then, you know, the interdisciplinary nature of landscape architecture can sometimes run up against uh, a siloed agency culture of, of specialists um, and trying to bridge those gaps is a, is a, a trick that, um, that we're constantly trying to do. Um, so what does it mean to be a leader in a field? You know, I think um, good leaders have a knack for sensing what's coming, and, uh, and narrow focus isn't as helpful. You know, in the Forest Service, we grow trees and manage ecosystems, and so we're always thinking very long-term out into the future. Um, LAs are, are taught to consider a wide range of effects and influences, um, and we tend to have a broader awareness of potential conflicts and points of interest, and I think that can help. Um, and that's kind of what we bring to the table. Um, you know, as the Forest Service is a multiple use, uh, has a multiple use mission. And so we have many motivation and points, and points of view on every pro- project that we do. Um, and LAs can be conveners and, uh, and helping bring those, those stakeholders into agreement on a way forward. Um, so how do we impact the uh, public and the spaces we inhabit? Um, well, you know, everything we do is for the public. Um, you know, in the Forest Service, there may not be as much opportunity to wow people with, with site furnishings or lighting or materials, patterns or shapes. Um, our palette can be a little more limited, um, but to me it, it elevates design that's more in tune with its surroundings. Um, you know, we have to make maximal use of the natural attributes of the space, um, hopefully with minimal disruption and, and usually on as small a budget as possible. And so the goal is to show off a landscape through our recreation sites and our roads and trails. Um, you know, if we've done it well, then the hope is that the visitor has a meaningful experience during their time in the forest and uh, that they'll remember and value that experience in landscape. And then hopefully if they value the landscape, uh, then they'll support its continued protection. So to talk a little bit about where I came from and my edu- education background, I'm only four years out of school. Um, so I got a um, bachelor's in construction management and a master's of landscape architecture from Mississippi State University in Starville, Mississippi. Um, the uh, picture there is of a project that we won an ASLA Award of Excellence in Student Collaboration for, um, for working with the uh, College of Architecture and Graphic Design students and Building Construction Science students um, to incorporate a lot of green building and, and green infrastructure uh, into a local heritage museum. Um, it was a, a great project that's gone on for several years and uh, was a, a fantastic design build opportunity for the, for the students. Um, I also wrote my thesis on cultural landscapes. I worked with the Park Service on a, uh, a cultural landscape report for a national monument in northeast Alabama um, dealing with uh, cultural landscapes and, and historic integrity of that site. Before I went into professional service with the, the federal service, um, next slide, I was a uh, construction estimator for a large general contractor for a year. Uh, got caught in the uh, economic downturn and went back to school. Um, while there, I did uh, two internships with the Student Conservation Association, um, one with the National Park Service on the Blue Ridge Parkway in North Carolina, and the other in their regional office um, in Atlanta, uh, mainly working on my thesis while I was there. Uh, this SCA interns are fantastic. I wish I had known about them before grad school, and they're a great way to, uh, to get your foot in the door and, and test out federal service and, and see if you like it. Um, some of the skill sets that I think are helpful um, – one is the ability to wear many hats. Um, my varied experience allows me to not only work as a landscape architect uh, in the agency, um, but to work closely with engineers and land staff and surveyors and contractors and budget analysts and archaeologists and biologists and, and uh, a whole bunch of other specialists. Um, and it helps to have a pragmatic approach. Um, you have to collaborate and incorporate many different interests. Um, you know, and as public trustees, we have to be long-term. We have to be sustainability focused. Um, you know, hopefully the things that we do and the lands that we manage will be managed into perpetuity. And so you want to you wanna think as long-term and, and be sort of trend-resistant uh, in your design um, steps. 
So um, the last question is, what I, was I aware of federal service as an option while I was in school? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, you know, I kind of came back to grad school with the hopes of getting into the Park Service or the Forest Service. Again, the, uh, the student conservation internships were a great way uh, for me to get in. Um, and then I discovered the Presidential Management Fellows Program uh, on my own through the Partnership for Public Service. It's traditionally not targeted to landscape architecture students, and uh, we are hoping to change that uh, through things like this webinar, um, uh, because it's a great way to get into to federal service, and it's a, it's a fantastic experience. So with that, I think we're going to take some questions from, uh, about, uh, from me, Matt, and Jen. Great. Thanks so much, Jesse. So um, there was a question. There were several questions about um, each of your pathways into federal service. And um, for those of you unaware, this presentation will be going until about a quarter past the hour, and we'll be hearing um, more after this Q&A about pathways. So we'll be covering more of that um, later on as well. But um, for both um, Jen and Jesse, and Jen will take this first, if you could just um, briefly talk about um, your path into federal service um, just in a minute or two. Um, wrapping up with your educational background, and there were questions about the private sector experience. Would you recommend this before entering federal, federal service? So um, Jen will at least be speaking a bit to that private sector background as well, and then Jesse, if you could take it over from there. Thanks. Uh, so I would definitely, I definitely think that working uh, on landscapes, um, experiencing a project um, from program concept design development, construction, and really being in the field and doing construction administration is exceptionally valuable. You really are able to speak what you're um, reviewing. You have a better vocabulary to draw from. So I had um, six and a half years of private sector work. Um, that project, the Grand Teton National Park project, was actually done privately with the Rockefeller Foundation um, and Hershberger Design out of uh, Highmark, um, if you're listening, um, out of uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Um, so definitely recommend if you're in private sector, don't leave it yet. Get lots of experience um, and then, you know, consider federal. We need really great firms who understand how to work in these federal properties. It's not always easy. Um, prior to that, um, I uh, switched careers um, and went to the University of Pennsylvania and got a master's in landscape architecture. Um, but prior to that, I had a completely different job and was in conflict resolution and peace studies and lived in Russia for six years. So you never know. <laughs> <laughs> I have a really diverse background, um, which I actually think is fantastic for landscape architects. Great. Thanks, Jen. And for you, Jesse, too, just about a, a minute of your background elaborate on anything that you just discussed. Yeah, so I discussed um, you know, my educational background and, and kind of how I got in uh, to federal service. Um, yeah, I think my private practice experience was, was um, very, uh, very important, um, even though it wasn't necessarily landscape architecture. It did teach me how projects are put together and how to budget for them and how to uh, estimate costs and really think through how a project will be done and how it will be built. Um, you know, I think that's the experience you can get uh, in, in federal government coming straight in, but, um, but I think the private sector accelerates it a little bit. Um, but it, it's important, too, to, to understand that, that you know, it, it's, a, it's a different gig uh, than, a, than a private firm. Um, and... Uh, and so you have to kind of have that expectation going into it. Um, with the, you know, as far as how the Presidential Management Fellows Program works, I think Logan and Emily are going to really explain more of the particulars about that, um, along with some other ways to, to go in um, and, and try to get into the federal government. So. Great. Thanks, Jesse. And now a question for Matt. There is a question um, of these 150 landscape architects you have on staff, where are they based and um, what do they do? And there was another question about um, those wanting to know more about how more entry-level folks spend their time. So if you could address some of those things, Matt, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I don't want to be left out of that private sector conversation, though, because <laughs> I, too, came in um, after school. I worked in... Uh, Lee Weintraub's basement in uh, uh, Yonkers, New York. And, um, you know, the AutoCAD monkey thing, and it all applies in late night hours and last minute bids, et cetera. Um, but Lee's, a lot of Lee's ethic in, in working in underserved communities in 
the South Bronx uh, really gave me a chance on projects like uh, Hunts Point uh, Riverfront and, and uh, Bronx River uh, to kind of understand that our investment and our time in these communities really does have value. And I started through the Forest Service and the Urban and Community Forestry Program you know, working on these small, smaller scale local investments. So the private sector was, was really important to that. Lee was really important to that. And uh, so kind of helped me get to where I am today. So long journey from there, though. Um, as far as where our LAs are working, I should note that while we have about 150, a little over 150 now, that's down from our peak, uh, which was about 350 in the early 80s. And as many of you who follow any of this history know, that was um, about the time uh, post the National Forest Management Act where landscape aesthetics uh, were becoming more and more a part of the, of the public domain and the need to balance the timber extraction that was going on with the visual um, uh, mitigation, uh, visual resource values were, were finally coming in. And LAs were, were seen as, as, the, as the keepers, as the, as the stewards of, of, of landscape aesthetic. Um, that doesn't mean that we have a National Scenery Act, which we should, uh, which would give us more leverage in um, uh, compensation and mitigation for those types of projects, but that's just my soapbox. Uh, but as far as where folks are now, many are still practicing on, on the national forest, and a goal would, would ultimately be to have at least one landscape architect uh, on a national forest. Many in, 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 in are working in the regions. As I mentioned, them, some of them are working on enterprise teams uh, that uh, do act as, as small consulting firms, uh, and also in this emerging area of urban and community forestry, state and private forestry, uh, and research. So um, uh, as uh, our LAs begin to move up and move on, many of them, like Jesse, find themselves in recreation program leadership roles. Uh, we've been expanding, and I, I think you will talk a little bit later about what um, positions do look like and, and how they get uh, filled. Um, but we're trying to expand our understanding of what a traditional landscape architect and the Forest Service is and can do, uh, that the diversity of experience and the broadening of that skill set really does pay dividends for any type of, of a job that comes in contact with a, with a federal parcel of land. Um, I should also note really, really quickly that, you know, we're heavily represented in the Forest Service here today, which is great. And we <laughs> thank you all for that opportunity to get a message out. Sorry, Jen. Um, but, you know, there, there are a, a lot of incredible opportunities in many, many federal agencies. You know, the work Christian Gabriel does uh, at uh, GSA, uh, the, the Bureau of Land Management has a, a huge in, investment now in recreation, uh, fish and wildlife and their wonderful interpretation and education programs. Uh, you know, even NOAA um, in a lot of the interface between coastal communities. And uh, so... While we're, while we're pretty heavy uh, here today, I think you, we need to look elsewhere as well. So I'm getting the wrap-up single note from Mariana, so I think I'm going to just let us go back into the presentation. So thank you. Thanks so much, Matt. <laughs> um, and now we'll be hearing for about 10 minutes um, from first Emily Lauderdale and then Logan Free about pathways into federal service. And for those of you who can hang on, we'll be um, wrapping it up with a few more questions. And there have been many great questions posed today, so please know that um, we'll be looking through all of these, sharing them with our presenters, and hopefully finding a way to, to reach those of you who pose those questions um, at a later date. Take it away, Emily. Okay, thanks, Ariana. Um, this is Emily. I'm a current uh, Presidential Management Fellow, which is one of the Pathways programs that Logan Free and I will be talking about. Um, I graduated with an MLA from the University of Michigan in 2014, and I started my fellowship position on the Willamette National Forest last November. And as you can see, um, or you might have noticed that my position title is actually Natural Resources Specialist and not Landscape Architect. Um, so even though it isn't my job title, though a lot of the projects that I work on are LA-related, um, I've done some conceptual designs for recreation areas, uh, planting plans, and scenery analyses, but I also do things um, with uh, environmental impact statements 
um, working with the NEPA process and the forest planner. So uh, we'll kind of be talking about this a little bit later as well, that PMF positions can be relatively flexible depending on the hosting office and the skill sets of the PMF. Um, and with the landscape architecture background, that sort of prevent, uh, presents a, a wide variety of skills to work from. Uh, so the Pathways programs are actually a set of three programs that provide clear paths to internships and careers with federal agencies. Um, so there are actually a lot of uh, federal agencies that work with Pathways, um, but some of the agencies that might be uh, more of an interest to landscape architects include, of course, the U.S. Forest Service, as we've heard a lot from, uh, the National Park Service, um, the Bureau of Land Management, um, and a number of others as well. Uh, there are opportunities for current students, and that can range from high school students through graduate level students, um, as well as recent graduates. And the programs um, have a lot of perks. Um, they uh, include like meaningful training opportunities. Um, there's often a, a training requirement um, with the programs um, and career development opportunities. Um, and I've uh, included um, some links there. Uh, as well that you can see. So first I'll talk a bit about the internship program. Um, these programs or positions are announced through USA Jobs um, and can be searched from the Pathways program site. Uh, they're for current students um, and again high school through graduate level. Uh, they're paid opportunities that allow students to um, explore federal careers, and these are uh, full or part-time um, positions. And interns have uh, the opportunity to be converted to a permanent position uh, within 120 days of successful completion of the program. Um, there are an additional uh, agency-specific requirements um, that can vary based on the agency that's chosen. Um, and then there's also the recent graduates program, which is uh, also the opportunities are announced through USA Jobs um, and can be searched through the Pathways program site again. And um, these positions are for recent graduates who have completed a qualifying degree within the uh, past previous two years. And a lot of degrees qualify, um, anything from associate's degrees uh, to professional um, to vocational or technical. It really varies depending on the specific position. Um, there's also a special note for veterans, um, veterans who are unable to apply within the two years of graduation due to military service they actually have up to six years after graduation to apply. Um, and this program and position is a one-year program um, with mentorship as part of the program. Um, as Logan will probably mention with the uh, PMF program, um, I think the federal agency positions really have a benefit of um, really having very strong mentorship and uh, um, career uh, guidance um, through coworkers. Uh, there's uh, 40 hours of formal interactive training requirement for the recent graduates program, and there's also uh, the opportunity for conversion to a permanent position uh, following the successful completion of the program. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Logan to talk uh, more about the PMF program. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Emily. This is Logan Free. Um, I am a landscape architect as well and a 2015 Presidential Management Fellow with the Washington office. I am based in the Recreation, Heritage, and Volunteer Resources Staff Unit and, of course, work for the USDA Forest Service. And Emily covered two of the three pathways avenues for federal service, and I will cover the third one. It is called the Presidential Management Fellows Program, and it's the way that Emily, myself, and also Jesse made it into the federal government. But it's the flagship OPM leadership uh, development program that's designed to assist federal agencies in cultivating potential future leaders in the management of public policies and programs. It's open to advanced degree candidates that will graduate by 
to August of the following year of the annual application or advanced degree holders that have graduated within the last two years prior to the application date. The program overall, um, it consists of a two-year fellowship with 80 hours required annual training and a four to six month developmental assignment or a rotation. Upon successful completion of the fellowship, fellows are able to convert into a permanent position either in the position in which they held as a fellow or um, into a different um, position altogether. The, there's a wide and varying array of participating agencies um, within the PMF program. From the 2015 um, PMF program, this is just a sample, but USAID, USDA, Department of Energy, Department of Defense, Department of Education, EPA, GSA, HUD, which is the Housing and Urban Development um, Agency, all sorts of agencies participated and brought fellows on. The hiring cycle is rather lengthy um, and arduous. It spans several months, and it actually will open in a few weeks in the beginning of October. It's a two-tiered application process. The first is an online assessment, which will open, as I said, in a few weeks on USA Jobs. If you're interested, I highly recommend you go to pmf.gov, I believe is the URL, and you can find more information about that. But it's a two-week window. You have your online assessment. Four to six weeks after this initial application closes, semifinalists are announced. Then you have to go through the second portion of the application, which is the in-person assessment, which will take place in D.C. A couple months, maybe a month after that, finalists are announced via email, and they will have 12 months of appointment eligibility, um, and then they are then eligible to start applying to different positions that these agencies are going to fly. A few of the projects that a PMF might work on as a Forest Service PMF um, is landscape design, um, construction oversight, project planning, um, long-range restoration planning, all the way on up to national program planning and management. There's many different positions to fill. Um, it's a very wide and diverse agency. Um, it's a multi-use land management agency with 174 national forests a far-reaching state and private forestry deputy area, an expansive research and development arm. There's tons and tons of different um, exciting opportunities to, to work in. An example, uh, some example positions that PMS have held over the years are landscape architects, uh, botanists, hydrologists, geologists, deeper planners, wooden biomass utilization uh, specialists, all sorts of um, different positions. So why subject yourself to the month-long application <laughs> um, As I mentioned before, you get 80 hours of annual training to support your specific career development. You're required to take a four- to six-month rotational assignment, which is an incredible opportunity to gain a wide breadth of experiences, serving in a different capacity. You get... Um, or PMS enjoy rapid promotion, often advancing the pay scale twice in two years. You receive top mentorship from top leaders in the agency, including Mr. Arn, who spoke before. And most importantly, you'll be serving the public and will have the chance to impact the future of our country um, as a civil servant and federal employee. You're working towards something much larger than yourself, and knowing that your hard work is of benefit to the United States and the citizens is very re rewarding. And with that, I will stop, and I believe we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you so much, Emily and Logan. Uh, we are now going to wrap up with just one final question, um, which is, do you feel that you get to design in your current position? And Jennifer Daniels will be taking that. Um, I also want to address many questions that were posed by mid-level professionals who are looking to enter federal service. In the resources tab, there is a recording um, that guides you on how to apply through USA Jobs. So that will be a very useful resource for you. Um, so thank you for those questions. Um, now take it away, Jen, and then we'll be um, getting a wrap-up from Roxanne here at ASLA. So um, do you get to design? I would say yes, but not in the traditional sense if, uh, that design firms would. So the exciting part, in fact, earlier today I was in a design workshop meeting on that project I presented on um, called Experience Migration, but I sat next to the landscape architect and the architect and our entire team debating um, the substrates 
um, debating and discussing and drawing and sketching which way the amphitheater would face. So absolutely. Um, I spent my years as a CAD monkey. Um, I spent my years um, working through designs and throwing sketch all over the floor. Um, but that's not my role right now, and that's actually not what I love doing. I love working as a team, and I love seeing the team and the designs come to fruition. And I love working with incredible design teams. Um, so, again, that was my focus. Spend the time in the design firms. If that's really what you want to be doing, if you want to be drawing every day, that's where you should be. Um, but if you want to be affecting these iconic landscapes, then yes, you'll be designing, but in a very different kind of way and from a different perspective. And Matt wants to say something for sure. Yeah, I just wanted to, <laughs> not enough, not enough, not enough. Um, I just wanted to shout out to the Park Service and Army Corps. I was uh, scolded in the comments we section for, for uh, not mentioning the opportunities there. Rivers Trails Conservation Service uh, assist, uh, assistance in, in urban, um, also throughout the park system and as planners and interpreters, etc. So great opportunities in the Park Service Army Corps, which has almost 100 LAs practicing around the world. So. Great. Well, thank you so, so much. And um, I want to shout out to the many people who joined us in the comments section. We got a hello from Texas from Jason. Kevin said, yes, Alaska, during Matt's presentation. Alyssa did a study on the bridge at Multnomah Falls. And um, we got remarks on beautiful country. We got hellos from Kansas and even listening in from the L train in New York. So thank you all for uh, all the effort in joining us today. Um, and now I will hand it over to Roxanne Blackwell. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ariana. And uh, a special thank you to everyone participating in today's webinar, um, particularly our outstanding panelists who are doing some amazing work in our federal agencies. And I also really want to thank our webinar participants who are now undoubtedly eager to become leaders in the federal service. Uh, due to the overwhelming response to this webinar and the subject matter, ASLA and LAF will explore opportunities to host follow-up events that could include landscape architects from some of our other federal agencies, including GSA, BLM, Army Corps of Engineers, National Park Service, and Department of Transportation. Um, please stay tuned for follow-up information that will be sent out to webinar participants um, participating in today's webinar. And finally, as a reminder, please take a moment to fill out the survey that will be sent to you immediately following the webinar. Your feedback is really important to us. So thank you again, and have a great day.